Take us into lunch. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Appreciate taking time out of your busy uh, schedules to be here because in today's world where uh, everyone's trying to do more with less and so we're doing everything with nobody, it's hard to get away for events like this. So uh, what you're doing here is something you have to do every day or you become obsolete. Unless you're looking at retirement, uh, you cannot afford to become obsolete. So with that said, um, Thank you, Rick. You have a great program here. I like the logical flow, and hopefully not too much repetition here, but I think we'll try not to step on other presenters' toes, but it's a very logical order, so thanks for doing that. Implementation challenges and best practices of PTP. Look at that. My goodness. An SDI video plant. Who would build a plant that looks like that? That's your grandfather's SDI plant. <laughs> Look at all that messy cabling and connections, and what a waste. BNC connectors. Ah, all the cool kids are moving to IP. Because look how much simpler that, what's that? Have you seen a network rack top? I try not to look too carefully. You're ruining my story. Okay, so look how much simpler that's going to be. Everything just is an in and an output, and uh, my goodness, just think of all the cabling we don't have to worry about. The truck guys, you don't have to worry about being over 80,000 pounds going down the highway. They get rid of the cabling. So there's a lot of simplicity to it. But with simplicity comes complexity in many ways. And that's why we're all here trying to figure this out. One thing I've learned, fortunately I have a son that's doing well. He's a cybersecurity expert responsible for a global government system. So I kind of bounce ideas off of him of how data people think compared to how video people need to think. What I've learned, there's a big difference. So as far as data people understanding things like uh, smoothness, my son says, I have no idea how smooth my network is. If it takes 15 seconds or 25 seconds for something to upload or download, that's fine with him. Nobody complains. We're in the video business and the audio business. Everything needs to be here exactly the moment that I need it. There's no resending, there's no reshuffling. It's got to be here smoothly. So if you're taking data people into the video world, I think that's the major culture shift that we have to make sure that we can all agree upon. That smoothness is everything. Without smoothness, we're not doing video. And there lies the problem. Another problem I see, in case you haven't noticed, one of the cool things about my job is I get to go see a lot of different facilities, a lot of different companies, the culture, what they're actually doing, what they're not doing, what they think they're going to be doing, what they don't know, what they don't know. But what I'm seeing more and more, perhaps you've noticed it, is data people, IT people are running the show, where video people are kind of, well, let's say dinosaurs. and. Uh, Dinosaurs, we don't really need a whole lot more of those. So quite often when you need to cut someone, oh, those video dinosaurs, we don't need those anymore because we have data people that can run the show. That usually works until the first problem pops up and they have to bring people back as consultants. <laughs> With that said, Tektronix likes to sell test equipment, but we need users to sell test equipment too. And those users have to be able to justify it to someone who's looking for a business case. Without a business case, nothing gets justified, nothing gets justified, there's no budget, and Carl might become an employee. We want to avoid that. What is even worse if we don't have any users, period? So with that said, as they're looking to cut people, the people that understand all this stuff, because realistically, we live a lifestyle. My son being a data guy, there's no 14-hour days, there's no weekends, there's no two in the morning, there's none of that. Holidays, he has off, he takes a vacation, nobody bothers him. He's in Mexico right now for a week. He's not the least bit worried about his network. Can you say that about your facility? You're worried about it right now. It's a big difference. So with that said, what I think we're doing, let's say a miserable job, is selling ourselves to people who control our futures. We've got to be seen as something that saves money, makes money keeps us out of trouble, makes sure that we're compliant, we're meeting delivery specifications. We've got to be seen as an asset, not a liability. We're an expense. 
Because the higher you go in an organization, they're spreadsheet geniuses. They're not technology geniuses. If they were a technology genius, they're obsolete, don't even know what you do for a living anymore. So what we have to do is be able to talk to business people about the value we bring. That way they keep us around. So I've said this last year, people gave me good feedback, I'm saying it again this year. If you weren't here last year, this might be news to you. If you're here last year, look over the last year. Have you been good at selling yourself to the value of the people who control your future of why they need to keep you around? I look at this whole transition to IP. Well, I can't think of a good word, maybe you'll help me. It's kind of like the uh, Technical Staff Full Employment Act. <laughs> really it is. They need us more than ever. But do they realize that? It's our job. Going from SDI to IP, IP is about packets. A simple network, it should be smooth. The more stuff you put on the same pipe, the more everybody has to have an agreement of who gets to go out next. Didn't have that problem with SDI. Everybody's sharing the same pipe. With that said, who has a priority over someone else? I'm talking about PTP, which means PTP, let's face it, black burst and tri-level, too dependable, we have to get rid of it. So we're going to PTP, which is a bi-directional system for timing a network, which we have never done before. It's all about precision. My son runs his network in NTP. In our world, that's about as accurate as SMPTE time code, which is good enough for switching a network on the hour, half hour, whatever. We need precision down to the packet level. So how do we get packet level precision in a bi-directional timing network that has everything else sharing the same pipe? So one of the first things you have to realize, commercial off the shelf is not the cheapest thing you can find on Amazon. It needs to be something that's considered enterprise class, business class, that understands and is PTP aware which means as a quality of service that says precision time protocol is the most important packet that it will ever see. It's kilobits. Audio is megabits, video is gigabits, but the kilobit package, packets are the most critical. They've got to have the quality of service, which means they get the royal treatment in and right out as fast as possible. That way you maintain stability in a network. It's all about smoothness. Because the world we're living in now is layers of abstraction. Back in the good old days, I started in video back in ninth grade. You talked to the expert, because back then people knew video from the glass of the lens of the glass of a CRT, how a system worked. No one in this room has that understanding anymore. How does it start? How does it get from point A to point B? How, how is it delivered? But back in the good old days, when dealing with analog, you take your greeny tweaker, you turn pot number three, a quarter turn, and hey, look at that. My audio and video actually changed. Turn it the other way, the audio and video actually changed. So we went to SDI, had a cliff effect. Now we're going to IP. We've added a whole other layer to it. The analogy, I'll share my grandfather. My great-grandfather has steam-powered cars, Stanley Steamer. Before you go for a ride somewhere, you better know how to set every every little valve, every lever, and what every gauge needs to read, or else you might not make it or have a horrible death with a boiler explosion. <laughs> that was driving a car. I got involved with cars, you're taking apart carburetors, distributors, I could do a valve job, you know, it was mechanical fuel pumps, I could work on a car. Now your car, what can you do on your car yourself? It's codes, it's sensors, the dealer has to figure out what the codes mean. It's a layer of abstraction. We're moved further and further away from the nuts and bolts of what's actually happening. That's the world we now live in, in video networks. We need to visualize smoothness. How accurate is accurate? Well, with NTSC, we're down to picosecond. You're timing to the third excursion of the chroma burst. SDI, we're down basically to pixel timing. Now with PTP in the world of IP 2110 we're going to, it's datagrams. It's packets, so it doesn't really need to be as accurate, but still, it needs to have the packets correctly timed. And typically, uh, if you have 920 uh, pixels per line, it's roughly four packets per line, so there's a whole lot of packets going on here. Okay, so timing, simply 2110 timing. As we touched on in the previous presentation, we have precision time protocol, we have a grandmaster clock, that's locked, hopefully, to GPS. 
That's a 62-bit system. And what we're trying to get to is put packets, timing into the packets, which is actually a 32-bit time sample we're putting into the packets. And what we're doing here, take an internal clock, put it in the packets, because the beauty of 2110 is the fact that you have separate packets for audio, video, metadata, all the stuff we've been talking about all morning, which is a wonderful thing. But somehow it's all got to come back together. Either putting it in SDI or delivering it to the world, the audio and the video and the metadata have to be time correlated. So we need a common timestamp. I believe the RTP timestamps derive from GPS. Uh, they repeat like every 13 hours, I believe, is how I understand it. So it's, it's a clock, and we get everything back together. So in a PTP network, we have a master and a backup a backup network, because we like redundancy in this world, because that's how we keep things on the air. And briefly touched on the best master clock algorithm, which clock is worthy of running the show. If they're both equal, well, you need a pecking order to decide who takes over to run the show at any given moment. If you do nothing with configuration, which I'll briefly get into that, it goes by the lowest MAC address. The unit with the lowest MAC address is the one that runs the show. You can have one, two, three, multiple time units. And this becomes important because in my own little brain, I kind of thought about this too much. And back in the old days, computer system, we knew where computer systems started and ended. Where's computer systems start and end now? Where's the internet? Well, it's everywhere, but I really don't know where the internet is. I think at some point video networks will get to this point. Where is my video network? It's out there. It's in the cloud. Everything's connected. You start connecting network against network. How do you time a network? that are two independent networks that are now one network. You need this pecking order, this hierarchy of deciding which timing device is running the show. That way everything's on a common time base. So you have a primary and you have a backup. Briefly talked about in the previous presentation, transparent switches and boundary switches. From what I'm hearing from the battle, from the war, from the front, is when in doubt, put in a boundary clock. If you look at this, it's kind of like a, uh, an org chart in a corporation. It's a chain of command in the military. You have the general at the top, the king, whatever you want to call it, and all the devices down below, perhaps hundreds if not thousands, so you need a chain of command. The lead clock does not want to be bothered with answering all the requests and dealing with hundreds if not thousands of devices in the network. So the boundary clock divides the network. That way, the Grand Master at the top is talking mainly to boundary switches. The boundary switches deal with all the, the whining and complaining from the actual devices out in the field. Kind of like, you know, do, when Carl has a problem, do I go right to the president of Tektronix? Probably not a good idea because there's a chain of command. It's the same thing in timing a network. And this is where our IT people really come in to uh, bring in their value because Topology, your architecture, this is not something video people tend to think about, but how do you have redundancy? How do you have resilience? How do you have properly allocated switches as far as bandwidth? Because an oversubscribed switch is not a good thing because it doesn't work. So what you need to be doing is having good conversations with your IT experts to how do I make this network? We talked briefly earlier today about spines and leafs, I look at it this way, if you need high bandwidth, it's a spine. If you need to distribute things out at a lower level, then it's to a leaf, actually out to the clients. Do you want air-gapped, or do, how do you want things connected? You can have air-gapped with the fact that you're using the wonder of an atomic clock flying 12,000 miles over your head called GPS. That gives you a common time base, even though they're not really directly connected. So GPS, when in doubt, make sure you're using GPS. Or do you want them cross-connected? Some facilities I'm involved with that are green field for what the biggest concern is. Have you ever heard of an SDI system getting a virus? No. Could that happen in this world we're going to? Yes. So high availability networks, they want to have them as separate as possible. In fact, maybe vendor A over here, vendor B over there in case something gets loose as far as the virus. It doesn't take down the whole system because they're independent systems. How much redundancy can you afford? That's the question. Some people say, I don't have room for redundancy, don't have, exp don't have the budget for redundancy, so we'll just kind of do the best we can without it. Everybody needs to make a business decision of how 
they're going to spend their money and how they're going to protect their investment. Leaf networks. How do you want to set up your network? Where's your cross point? Where's your redundancy? How isolated are they? Once again, you have a spine high bandwidth. A leaf is more or less dealing with the, the clients themselves. And when in doubt, boundary clock. Once again, boundary clocks isolate your network so that way you're keeping the load off of up here. Do not want thousands of devices going all the way back up through your network talking to a grand master. Troubleshooting. <laughs> well, it's something that we do for a living. The method methodology of troubleshooting is still the same. Where is my system working? Where isn't it working? And then try to figure out why it's not working. So still problem isolation is the same, but there's different steps we have to go through. Some of the high level concepts of PTP. <coughs> Configuration is everything. In SDI, output went to in and you're doing video. In the world of IP and PTP, Everything is about configuration. One typo, one drop down, one radio button clicked wrong, guess what? It doesn't work. With NMOS, it's going to make life a little bit easier because there's just some automatic things going on. But still, it's all about configuration. So video people, we're moving into the world where configuration is everything. You configure something before you hook it to the network. And what I believe goes on at the interops, from what I have been, sh it's been shared with me, there's a quarantine process. You don't just take a new device and hook it to a network and say, gee, I hope this works. You have an isolated test network to say, okay, here's configuration. I'm gonna hook it up to my test network and say, okay, it's working. It didn't take down my test network. So there's definitely a different methodology. In the world of SDI, did we have quarantining processes? Out went to in, in went to out. I mean, you had a connection. It's the way it is. Now, it's all about configuration. What domain? All your PTP devices have to have the blank filled in with domain number. If it's the same, you probably talk. If it's not the same, it's never gonna talk. So it's, the whole idea is configuration. What profile? The world we live in, SMPTE profile, it's typically what we're going to be utilizing, and that sends commands eight times per second. Communication mode, multicast, unicast, SMPTE mix mode. SMPTE mix mode is essentially from the grandmaster out, it's multicast. From the slave client devices all the way back, it's unicast. So you have to decide which method you're going, but once again, everything on the network must agree with the configuration that you have, or else things just plain don't talk. Verified domain talked about that and how you do that. You can do that in Wireshark. You can do that on our test instruments. The whole idea is to say what domain at this point in the network is actually being used, and are all the devices on this network configured to actually see what's happening. So do a PCAP file, put it in Wireshark. If you're not familiar with Wireshark, become familiar. It's a very good tool. It's free. You can filter on the capture, or you can do a bulk capture, then do a filter after you do the capture, whichever way you want to do it. But it's a, a handy tool to have. But there, there's real-time tools that Tektronix has that allow you to see what's happening in real time. And about profile, general, AES, SMPTE, mixed mode, talked about that. Once again, have a screen there that shows you what's going on. PTP, actually, in a test instrument, what profile you're using, what's your priority one, your clock class, your clock accuracy, clock variance, priority two. Typically, from what I'm understanding, priority one, if everything has the same number, the lowest number wins, but if everything's the same, all devices at this point are equal. Then it looks at... What class is it? I'd rather have a GPS lock than a handset free running device. Because I like GPS, why not? So I'd rather have that SPG or that sync source running the show, lock the GPS compared to free running. Then how accurate is it? I'd rather have the clock that's more accurate running the show than one that is less accurate. If everything is equal there, you still need a tiebreaker. Priority two is where you would determine which piece of hardware is actually number one, number two, number three, or whatever. The lowest number wins. 
So that's where you might want to make a decision. If you make no decisions, pull the units out of the box, hook them up to a network. The safety feature is it goes with the lowest MAC address wins. So that way, if you know nothing, the system still works. But it's very important to know the MAC address of your units to see which one is actually the master at any given time, because the MAC address tells you which piece of hardware is actually running the show. Before you disconnect it or do anything like that, it's good to know. How often are messages being sent? Roughly eight times a second is what you want to be seeing. If you go less, there's less traffic, but stability might be uh, in question. And the same thing for AES and generic, same idea. Is your configuration what you think it is? Do your switches support multicast? Well, they need to do that because PTP is a multicast join. You have two ports that you look at for your multicast address. Port 320, 319 is the one you want to pay attention to the most. That's where your actual time-sensitive messages are carried. And if you don't see that, you're uh, missing all your messages. Grandmaster talked about the best master clock al algorithm, the pecking order. Once again, the final tiebreaker is the MAC address. And there you can actually see a MAC address on a piece of test equipment that says, this is the piece of hardware that's actually the master at this time. OK, so we need to time our systems. We're still dealing in the world of hybrid facilities for the foreseeable future. And we have our house reference, which is the X in the middle. And the video feed we're doing in the SDI world is the circle. When they line up, you're zero timed. Same thing with PTP and 2110. How much of an offset is there in time? You can see uh, pixels, vertical and horizontal offset. Visualization, we're trying to visualize the invisible. It's hard to see from where you're sitting, but what we have here are graphs. On this side, it's master slave delay, master slave variation. The flatter the line, unlike the cardiac intensive care ward, here a flat line is good news. And what you can see, since we're PTP is bi-directional, you have slave to master delay, slave to master variation. So you can see how your network is performing in both directions. We're bi-directionally timing our facility. So if you'd like to see graphics, we got them. But quite often, I start with min, max, and mean. The tighter these numbers are, it means the smoother your network. If there's a big difference between the numbers, you have an unstable network. Once again, the world of troubleshooting, where is my network stable? Where is it unstable? That's how your problem isolate. So once again, <laughs> visibility at various points in your network, as we've been doing our whole careers, is what you want to do. But there's no patch panels anymore. So you have to have tools that can look into this stuff. What we're seeing here is a multi-layer view, which is the world we're living in now. We still have audio and video. We still have all that. But now we have an IP layer. What it's showing here is a CRC, cyclical redundancy check, for the video layer itself. On every single line of video, this calculation is done. It totals up the ones and zeros for, for lumen chroma, puts in a magic number on that line of video. Test equipment does the same calculation at the receive, <coughs> comes up with a magic calculation number, and does a compare. If the number is equal, lum the lumen chroma levels are the same as they left. If they're not the same, you have corruption. So what we're showing here is we have RTP sequence error, which is an IP layer problem, and a CRC video problem. They're time correlated. So the hits in the video are actually problems at the IP layer. If you see no IP hits at the same time you have video hits, it's a video-related problem. Once again, root cause is what we're trying to always solve. I'm sure you've never done it. Maybe you've read about it on the internet, but finger pointing is rampant. Because nobody really knows. It can't be my beta code. It must be your beta code. Well, how dare you insult my beta code? That's the world we live in. So test equipment now, I see it as the judge, jury, and the executioner in all the deployments that are going on, because you don't know. You're dealing with layers of abstraction. You need visibility into these layers. OK, what we're showing here, this is the brand new SMPTE 2110-21, which is traffic shaping and delivery timing. Hard to see on the screen here, but it's called CMAX. This is, according to the spec, you're looking at the source, like 
out of a video source. So I'm creating video right at the source. You connect and see how smooth it is. And what it's considering, you're like looking at a leaky bucket, a buffer. The buffer should always be taking out at a given rate, but how things are coming in, bursty, overflow, underflow is what you're looking for. Once again, a smooth line is happy. Min, max, and mean that are tight is good news. Virtual receive buffer. This is roughly, as I said, uh, video line is four packets. This is around four packets, if I understand where we're going with this. So it sees what a receiver, how it is performing. This is you know, further into the network now to see what's actually coming to a device. Once again, smooth is what you want. How do I know what's good and what's bad? Let's say a part of your network is working. You see the signatures. Oh, that looks nice. Go to a different part of the network, and it looks very different. Well, usually different is not to your advantage, so you can see the corruption in the network itself. <coughs> OK, so a little bit closer view there of the CMAX. OK, now we're looking at uh, SMPTE 2110 10 stream timing. This is where you're looking at RTP packets derived from your GPS. In Tektronix, we like to look at if there's a timestamp anywhere, how can we look at it and compare it to something else? That way you can see network stability. Reference to receive. This is your house reference, PTP, to the actual video being received. How much latency is there? Min, max, and mean, the higher the number is better, the smoother this looks, the better. And you can zoom in and out. Minutes, hours, days. So you can see trending. Well, every day at 4 p.m., why do we have this instability? Well, that's what's known as a clue. We need to investigate that. RTP to receive, RTT, RTP time packets to the receive time packets. You're doing comparison. Under the, under the audio, look at this, audio to video. Isn't that about time? You can actually see the accuracy. Video is always the reference. Audio is either late or early. And what we can see, how much of a difference there is. Tighter the numbers, closer to zero to better. A flat line is a happy line because in a bursty network, Maybe they're not consistent. There might be a constant offset. Maybe there's not. RTP to, R to receive. So we're comparing another way. We're comparing as many clocks as we can. Like between data, like closed captioning, to video. How much of an offset is it there? Do you want the closed captioning to be correlated to the actual video you're looking at? Ah, put this guy to sleep. And what we're looking at here now is the 21 10-20, the actual video stability. What we're looking at here, I think the next slide does a better job, is distribution curves. I love distribution curves. This is absolutely perfect. This is a disaster. So you want something in this range here. So this is obviously a very simple network of 2110. And then we go to the next slide. See, it branches out a little bit. More of a bell curve is forming. This is probably more a bigger network. Once again, this is absolutely perfect on a tiny network. This is absolute chaos. So a bell curve, you can see the difference between the two. That's probably a more bigger network. And you can see here how the bell curve really starts to spread out. The bigger the network, but what you do not want is flat with outlier spikes all over the place. Because what you're having there is underflow, overflow, network instabilities in general. So uh, did anyone look at uh, your retirement portfolio while I was speaking? <laughs> <laughs> did anyone? Do, I, I do a lot of this training. People come up and say, well, Carl, we learned a lot. It's time to retire. So, uh, <laughs> so we do. Tektronix does uh, technology training and pre-retirement seminars. So. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We'll cover your Q&A uh, in the afternoon before okay. yeah, that's fine. having the panel.